Hello friends, IT Chapter 2 has arrived and the Losers Club is back to battle Pennywise. How does the conclusion to this two-film epic compare to Stephen King's source novel? I'll tell you. But you should know that there's going to be Pennywise-level spooky spoilers in this. For those who haven't read King's 1986 horror novel, first, you're missing out because it's great. Second, clear your schedule because it's like 1400 pages long. And third, the ending is completely bananas. Seriously, it's nuts. The 2017 film adaptation of It was a massive success, both financially and critically, and was celebrated for honoring the source material. While the details change greatly from page to screen, the monsters that It chooses to appear as in the novel are based on 1950s era horror schlock, there's no surrealist flute lady. Ugh. The themes and overall feel of the film nailed the novel's tone. Chapter 2, meanwhile, had a much harder task. It's not just that watching children battle a psychotic demon clown is a bit easier to digest, though the grown-up versions of the Losers Club are played beautifully by the likes of James McAvoy, Jessica Chastain, and Bill Hader especially. It's that the end of King's novel gets real out there. You see, we find out that It, or Pennywise, or the leper, or the horrifying flute lady, whatever, is actually an alien. She, yes, she, came to Earth on a meteor, or spacecraft, or something, it's unclear, in primordial days of old, much like Larry King. It crashed in what would eventually become Derry, Maine, and since then, it has terrorized whoever and whatever lived on that spot for a short period every 27 to 29 years. We see a bit of this backstory in the new film, though the book seems to go a bit farther back in time, but neither explore why people would continue living in an area haunted by an extraterrestrial shape-shifting clown demon. I guess the foliage, probably, right? The foliage? Beyond that bit of it backstory, the ultimate showdown between the Losers Club and Pennywise plays out quite a bit differently in the book than in the first film. In the book, young Bill engages the monster, which has a true form that looks like a gigantic spidery thing that plops out a bunch of slimy eggs, in the ritual of Chud, a battle of wills that mind melds the two and staples their tongues together. <laughs> Alone, though his friends are there for support. While the ritual of Chud is featured in chapter two, and adult Bill does battle it again as a grown-up, it is quite a bit different than how it's represented in the novel. Chud, in the novel, sends Bill flying through the cosmos on some weird rainbow road, not too unlike that course from the Mario Kart games. <laughs> Oh, also there's a gigantic omniscient turtle god, whose name is Matterin, who basically does nothing but watch the losers fight it and offer moral support. Then he dies, when they need him the most. Sweet. Thanks, turtle bro. Matterin is suspiciously absent from the film, despite a little tease in the first movie of a turtle made of Lego, and another tease of some turtle art in the new film. The exclusion of Matterin as a major presence is a bit odd, considering the importance the character plays not only in the losers' battle with Pennywise, but also his overall influence on the mythology and backstory of not just it, but many other King novels. Director Andy Muschietti has said that there are opportunities to explore its vast mythology, but don't expect to see any spin-offs soon. If they ever do happen, however, Matterin would almost certainly need to be included. You know, because he's important. Anyway, back to the ritual of Chud. In the film, the characters all come together to take down It. In the book, however, Mike is stuck in a hospital bed, and only Bill and Richie actually engage It in the final psychic battle, with Ben left behind to squish some eggs. Yeah. The heroes ultimately win, yay, but Eddie dies in the process, and being such great friends, they leave his body down in the sewers. At least in the movie, the place was collapsing. The entire town of Derry then explodes, as is the case for pretty much every single setting at the end of every single Stephen King novel. The dude's not great with endings. A fact that the new movie actually pokes fun at with the author's cameo. So, you know, at least he's in on the joke. That's a lot of weirdness, and clearly that's hard to represent in film. The book also includes an orgy scene among the kid version of the characters that the filmmakers never considered including. Good call. There are a number of other notable omissions from the novel. While Audra, Bill's wife, and Tom, Beverly's abusive husband, are featured in the film, the roles are significantly slimmed down from the books. Tom and Audra both act as major catalysts for their respective partners in opposing ways. For a film that has a runtime of over two and a half hours, reducing such important characters' roles may leave many book readers scratching their heads. At least we got that wonderful nod to the novel's most terrifying sequence involving Patrick Hochstetter and a pink fridge. Of course, adaptation is a tricky challenge. It isn't the only novel that has a reputation for being unfilmable, at least as a one-to-one -one adaptation. Cloud Atlas, Watchmen, hell, even Ulysses have all been translated to film, but the end result is rarely as good as the source. Frank Herbert's Dune was long thought to be too sprawling and esoteric to be translated to film, and David Lynch's 1984 adaptation was not well received and stripped a lot of the plot points away. Maybe Denis Villeneuve will have better luck with his triad at next year. Good luck topping Sting in a Speedo, though. Lengthier source material often makes for rougher screen translations, as does scope and more out-there concepts. King's It is one of his longest books, in fact it was his longest until he re-released The Stand in 1990, which he didn't need to do, and despite whatever flaws or changes made by Andy Muschietti, the recent films are undoubtedly a more impressive adaptation than the 1990 miniseries. In lots of ways, adaptation leaves creators in a kill your darling situation, having to make tough decisions to edit and cut content they may otherwise have loved to include. 
It's hard to believe any work is truly unfilmable. Heck, George R. R. Martin said he deliberately wrote Game of Thrones to be untranslatable to film. Look how that turned out. But the process isn't easy. If you think it is, let me leave you with these horrifying 1980s animated Lord of the Rings monstrosities that make Pennywise look like a Labradoodle. There is a wind. There is a wind. So, people who still read, how do you think the new film compares to the novel? Let us know in the comments right down there. Don't forget to subscribe and join us here every Friday morning for new episodes of Heat Vision Breakdown. Boo! Pennywise is scary.